John chapter 1. And we'll read there John chapter 1, uh, verses 28 to 30. John chapter 1. Verses 28 to 30. <coughs> the Bible says in John chapter 1 and verse 28. These things were done in Betharba, Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for each one here today. We thank you for the children singing this morning. Lord, what a great job they did. We thank you, God, for the children. Uh, here in our church. We pray that you bless them and their families and uh, have your perfect will in their lives. Lord, bless this message today. We pray if there be a lost soul here today in the congregation, that you might save them, dear Lord, and help us as Christians to live for you in these last days before you come back uh, to get us out of this wicked old world that we live in, Father. Have your will, Lord. We pray that you might be honored and glorified in everything that's said and done. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. Amen. We read here in John chapter 1, verses 28 to 30. I want to call your attention to verse 29, where it says in John 1, 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I want to preach a message this morning on beholding the Lord. Beholding the Lord. I looked up the word behold in the old 1828 dictionary, and it says that behold means to fix the eyes upon, to see with attention, to observe with care, to look upon, to direct the eyes to an object or person. Here in John chapter 1, verse 29, John says, uh, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. There are several times that the Bible says that we are to behold the Lord, and it gives various names to him. Here, the first one, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Peter said, For as much as ye you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. Uh, we're, we're not going to turn over there for the sake of time because I have several uh, things that I want to bring out this morning. But if you'll read and study sometime at your own leisure, Exodus chapter 12, the Passover lamb there. That Passover lamb was a picture of Jesus Christ Amen. in Exodus chapter 12. And in Exodus chapter 12, if you'll read and study, it, it says there, I'll read it for you, in, in Exodus 12, uh, verse 7, And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. This point is very striking indeed. Many thousands of lambs, were to be slain on that memorial night in Egypt, yet the Lord here designedly used the singular number when giving these instructions to Moses. Israel shall kill it, not them, plural, it, shall kill it. It is indeed remarkable that never once in Exodus chapter 12, the whole chapter, does the word lambs, the plural lambs, L-A-M-B-S, is used throughout uh, the 12th chapter of Exodus. There is only one, only one before God's mind, and that's the Lamb of Calvary. 
Yeah. You'll find, when you read and study Exodus 12, you'll find that not one time does God use the word lambs, plural. It's lamb, 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 over and over again. You'll notice uh, this type of a lamb of God. It says in Exodus 12, 6, the whole assembly of the congregation is to kill it in the evening. In the evening. Did you ever stop to think how ridiculous this is? 600,000 men left Egypt that night, but did, did, did they all kill one lamb? It says that in the Bible here. Uh, verse 6, kill it. That one lamb, it, represented every lamb that was ever killed. You'll notice in Exodus 12, 7, it says, strike it. Exodus 12, 8 says, eat it. Verse 9 says, eat not of it raw. Verse 10, let nothing of it remain. Exodus 12, 11, thus shall ye eat it. In the singular, the precious blood of Christ is that of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He is the one lamb that does the job for everybody. 600,000 up to 600 billion. It don't matter. And all through the chapter there, uh, it says it uses singular, singular, singular. And of course, the Exodus 12 is filled with pictures of the crucifixion. And uh, really, you would think that when you read Exodus 12, you would believe that whoever wrote that chapter saw the crucifixion take place because there's so many types. The day of the month matches the day that he was crucified. The lamb as a type of Christ is to be without blemish. That is sinless. He's to be a male. It's to be a male. I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but that means that Mary is in no way connected with salvation. It's a male lamb. And the male Jesus Christ is the one that we have salvation through. Mary was a good woman. And we preached a lot about Mary in the past. But Mary needed a Savior just like you and I do. Amen. And uh, so the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is guilty of the killing, according to Exodus 12, 6. And then there's three crosses in Exodus 12. are represented by the three places where the blood uh, is to be put, with the center cross higher than the other two, because the other two bore just sinners. Christ is denied water. Because of verse 9, Exodus 12, 9, eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but rose with fire. He said, I thirst, and he never got the water. I mean, all through Exodus chapter 12, I don't have time to teach Exodus 12. We'll be here all day, all afternoon. But there's just a few things there that I want to bring out uh, about the picture uh, of salvation. And he takes the believer's punishment in hell, as we see in Exodus 12, uh, verse uh, 8 and 9. And so this lamb here, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You know, in Genesis 22, uh, Isaac says, Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Genesis 22, 8 says, God will provide himself a lamb for the, burn, for the offering. That, you know, that's a prophecy concerning the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's going to provide himself which means Jesus was God. Amen? Amen? Yeah. I mean, God will provide himself a lamb. And so the first behold, to behold something is to look at it. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Secondly, look if you would at John 19. I want to show you a second behold. Most of these are in John and Matthew. Uh Look at John 19, if you would, in verse uh, 1. Then Pilate, John 19, 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Uh, purple is one of Rome's colors, by the way. It's one of Rome's uh, colors. You see a lot of purple when you go into certain churches. Verse 3, and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. Verse 4, Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Watch verse 5. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, here's the second, behold, 
Behold the man. Woo! What a man. Amen. That's a man right there. <clears throat> behold the man. First of all, we see the uh, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world in John 1 29. And we see him uh, in his sacrifice, you might say, as a lamb. Secondly, behold the man. We see him in his beauty. Behold the man. And John says, look right there. Behold, or uh, Pilate says, behold the man. Pilate knew that he was dealing with a real man when he dealt with Jesus Christ. Amen. And, I mean, he, he is a real uh, man. I, I jotted a few things down. First Timothy 3.16 says, uh, uh, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh in uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. And so behold the man. We see him in his beauty. I wrote these things down. First of all, he's a sinless man. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15. I mean, I want you to think about a man who lived on this earth 2,000 years ago that walked around like you and I do uh, in a, a body of flesh and a human being, he was a human being just like you and I, and he was absolutely sinless. He was ab You can't say that about Muhammad. You can't say that about the Muhammad religion, and you can't say that about Buddha and Islam and Catholicism or any of these other leaders or the popes or any of them, but Jesus Christ is absolutely sinless. Amen. Amen. Uh, see, behold the man. He's a sinless man. He's a suffering man. You see him on the cross suffering. For the sins of the world. There's several verses in the Bible that talk about him uh, suffering. And then thirdly, uh, he's a sympathetic man. He was very sympathetic when he was here on this earth towards people that were down and out. I mean, the longest record we have of him dealing with anybody is a woman who was married five times in John chapter 4. That's the longest record we have recorded in the Bible of him dealing with anybody. And John 3 and Nicodemus, he dealt with him a long time. But there's more verses in John 4. He dealt with that Samaritan woman that married five times. And the man she was living with was not her husband. Jesus was a simple. I'm not saying he condoned sin or put up. He likes sin. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying that uh, he was a sympathetic man. He's a suffering man, a sinless man. And number four, he was a seeking man. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost in Luke 19, verse 10. He's a seeking man. And uh, you and I ought to be seeking people that are lost without the Lord. He was a sent man. He said in John 20, 21, As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. John 20, 21. He was a sent man. He was a soul winning man. A soul winning man. He went about doing good, Acts 10, 38 says. He went about raising the dead, healing the blind, and uh, cleansing the lepers, and, and uh, saving people's souls, forgiving people's souls. He was a soul winning man. And he was a singing man. He's getting ready to be murdered. In Matthew 26, 30, it says, when they had sung a hymn, he went out into the mountain. They went out in the Mount of Olives. And Jesus and his disciples are singing a hymn and he's getting ready in less than a few hours. He's getting ready to be murdered. Within a few hours, he's going to be murdered. He's a singing man. Even though he's going through trials and tribulations and heartaches in his life and get ready to be murdered, that's a pretty big trial when you're getting ready to get murdered, get ready to get nails in your hands and your feet and get beaten beyond recognition. Isaiah says his visage was so marred more than any man in Isaiah 52, 14, they beat him and beat him, and he knows he's getting ready to go through that. I'll tell you, he's a singing man regardless. Well, I'm glad that regardless of what we go through, we might have trials and tribulations this morning and some heartaches and things that we might be concerned about, different things in our lives or our loved ones' lives. I'm thankful that we can still have a song in our hearts. Amen. He giveth songs in the night. It says in Job 35, 10, our maker, give us songs in the night. He's a singing man. And then I wrote this down. He's a skillful man. He had skill. He was a carpenter. I mean, he wasn't just, you know, he wasn't just a man here on this earth, you know, that sinless, thank God for that. But he he had he had a trade. He was skillful. And uh he was a he was a carpenter. 
And I'll tell you what, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you what, if he was a carpenter here on this earth, can you imagine the place he has prepared for you and I, those of us that are saved this morning? Amen. 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 I go to prepare a place for you. And he was a carpenter here on this earth. Praise God. And then I wrote down this. He's a smart man. He says, how smart is he? What would you... <laughs> So as I said, he's smart, to him, but demons come after me. Amen. A smart man. Think about a being that knows everything. I mean, if you, if, if some mathematician, I don't know if we have any here in the congregation, but if we have a mathematician, a, uh, I remember when I was in high school, I think I told you this, but my teacher up here in uh, Northland High School in Columbus, this guy was so smart, he ended up you say, must not have been too smart, I'm getting ready to tell you, but <laughs> he ended up murdering his wife in the front yard of their house. They got in a big fight. He was, he was so intelligent, I think he was a little bit off. Honestly. I think his IQ was so high. He was he, he's algebra, trigonometry, calculus, all that kind of stuff. And I took him for algebra and geometry. And I did I tell you what, I had no idea what he was talking about. I'm serious. I had no idea what this guy was talking about. I never even got the calculus. I took Algebra 1, and they had you take, back in the 70s there, they had you take Algebra 1, and then they had you take uh, Geometry, and then you had to take Algebra 2. But I think next was like Trigonometry and then Calculus, and some of these real smart kids in my class. You know, I remember, I remember, I think of their faces right now in my mind, real smart kids, you know, they took that, those, those type of classes trigonometry and calculus, the angles and the degrees, all that kind of stuff. I had no idea. He'd give me a D because he liked me. He passed me. I'm serious. He passed me. You say, you should have got an F? Yeah, I should have got an F. He passed me because I think he liked me. But uh, I, I'm not, I would, if I can remember his name, I wouldn't give his name. But anyways, uh, but he, they got, I remember, I remember one of my relatives told me they're in the Columbus Dispatch up there. They read in the paper. They're like, Mom and Dad found her something on the my sister or somebody, and uh, is in the paper there, and they got in a big fight during the holidays or something. I forget what it was several years ago, and they was fighting about something, and man, he, he they chased her out in the front yard and shot and killed her and then killed himself. But anyways, uh, this guy, I mean, he knew he knew calculus and trigonometry. Some people are like biology type people. Some people are like chemistry. Some people are very smart. You think about a man. Who knew all that. Hmm. He never had to ask somebody else or take a college course to try to get a degree. He didn't. He had all the degrees plus some. He was an omniscient being. Yeah. All knowing being. Think about a being like that. Think about a being here on this earth that could walk up to you and look at you and not only knows everything about you, but knows everything about everybody in your family and who all you're related to and what their addresses are and what their social security numbers are and how much money they got in the bank and how much investments they got and how many CDs and certificates and everything else they got. <laughs> how would you like to come head, head to head on being like that? That Samaritan woman looked at him and he said, Thou hast well said, thou, thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. I bet she about died of a heart attack. She's never met this man. And this man is telling her things about her intimate life. What a man. What a man. Knows everything. Knows everything. Never had to take one college course to learn anything. They ask in John 7, 15, how knoweth this man letters having never learned? Behold the man. Number three. Look at Matthew 12, if you would. Matthew chapter 12. And look over here. I'm talking about a man. What a man. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the man. And then thirdly, look over here. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 17. Matthew 12, 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, and this is in Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 4, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen. 
So the third behold is behold my servant, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. I don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to say that Jesus Christ was a servant according to the Bible. The Bible says, so we, he says, behold my servant. We see him in his life, his labor and his love. Servant. Jesus Christ never tried to act like that. He did say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He wasn't going to cower down about anything like that. He, you know, because he was, he was God Almighty. Behold, behold my servant. But Paul said in Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. As I say many times, what happens when a person humbles himself? God exalts him. Verse 9 goes on to say, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. In Philippians 2, 5 to 11. And so the third behold is behold my servant. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can see that Jesus Christ was a servant. Yes, he was a man. He was God and everything else, but he was a servant. Number four. Number four. Look at Matthew 12, verse 41. Matthew 12, 41, right there where we're at. Matthew 12, 41, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment. This is Jesus speaking. With this generation shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. Look what Jesus says. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Verse 42, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Watch this. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. So the fourth behold is behold the greater. Behold the greater. He says, I'm greater. I'm greater, verse 41, than Jonah, and I'm greater than Solomon. Amen. I want to tell you what, he's the great one. I remember Muhammad Ali. You remember him, the boxer? He was a great boxer, I have to admit. I never seen anybody punch as fast as he could, as quick as he could. He could do this. Now, I'll do it in slow motion, but he could do this. Quicker than you could blink your eyeball. I mean, those punches were like this. You didn't, you couldn't even get to you couldn't get to his face, but he he chopped your face all up. But he was quick, and he he go around and say, "I must be the greatest. I've got to be the greatest." Howard Cosell would say, "Now, how do you know you're the great? I've got to be the greatest. I am the greatest, Howard. Howard, I'm the greatest." Well, let me tell you something. There's somebody greater than him. Amen. Amen. And that is Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Jesus Christ is greater. Behold the greater. We see him in his supremacy, his preeminence, and his glory. There have been a lot of religious leaders, been a lot of sports athletes, a lot of human beings since Adam and Eve, the last 6,000 years, that have claimed to be great. But I'm here to tell you this morning, folks, Jesus is the greatest. Jesus Christ is the great one. He is the one that died for the sins of of the whole world that we could be saved from a literal, burning, eternal, tormenting, painful hell. Amen. And so uh, number four, behold the greater. He is uh, the greater. Now stay right here and look at Matthew 13 for number five. Matthew 13. Matthew 13 verse one. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. Matthew 13 two. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Watch three. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, here it is, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And then he goes and tells a story there about the seed falling on the stony ground and different things like that. I don't want to get into all that. We'll be here all day. But I want to say number five, Behold, the sower. And you say, well, preacher, he's talking about anybody, and me that bestows the word of God. Yes, he could be talking about anybody, but I believe he's also talking about himself because that's what he did when he was here on this earth. 
And you know what you and I do? We behold the sower. He is the sower. But you and I are to sow the word of God. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, talking about the word of God, right. bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalms 126, verses 5 and 6. So number 5, behold the sower. Behold the sower. In Isaiah 32, 20, it says, Blessed are ye that sow beside all waters. Beside all waters. Turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes 11. I want to show you this real quick before I go to the next point. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 11. You've got to see this. I can tell you what it says, but I think it'd be best if you could see it with your own eyes. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4. About sowing here. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 4. Now behold the sower. I, I believe he's talking about anybody that sows the word of God, obviously, but he's, I think he's primarily talking about himself because he's the one that's sowing here in the chapter and throughout the Gospels. Uh, Ecclesiastes 11.4, <clears throat> He that observeth the wind shall not sow. Now, some Christians are so concerned about the wind and the clouds, they don't sow. Let me tell you something, folks. A lot of people think, well, it's, you know, it's, it's the holidays and Christmas and Thanksgiving and, and New Year's and all this, this time of the season and everything. And this probably isn't a good time uh, to sow the word of God and to tell people. And I know I've said this in the last few weeks a lot, it seems like. But this is a great time to sow the word of God to unsaved relatives and neighbors and people like that. There's just a different kind of a spirit or whatever you want to call it in the month of December. I don't know what it is. Some people say it's satanic. I don't know. But I think people are a little bit more, generally, they're a little bit more open. Not everybody, but most people are a little bit more open and receptive to the word of God and the gospel. Because it's, you know, Jesus' birthday, you know, we celebrate and so forth. And so he that, he that observeth the wind shall not sow. So uh, you can preach all day about that. Some people think, well, uh, they observe the wind. That's weather. So if it's the weather, if it's raining out, if it's snowing out, if it's 90 degrees out, if it's this, if it's that, then it's not a good time to get the word of God out. There is never a bad time to get the word of God out. Yeah. Amen. Like one preacher said down south, he said, uh, the great good thing about the gospel is you can never send it to the wrong address. Right. Amen. You can never send the gospel to the wrong address. So if you observe the wind, you're not going to sow the word of God. And that's a picture of people. And not, it's not just the weather. It can include anything. You can preach and teach on anything about that. Uh, it can include anything. A lot of people, the least little thing that comes up. There are times, I have to say this, there are times when I was a young Christian. I don't care now if you've been saved for years. It don't matter. But when I was first saved, I'd say, I'm going to give this person a gospel tract. We're going up to the, you know, McDonald's or Wendy's or Burger King, one of these drive through restaurant places. And, you know, you order something, you go through the drive through I'm going to give whoever's at the window, I'm going to give them a gospel track. I got up there and it was some big old manager. Some big old guy looked like he'd tear your head right off your face. You know, right off your face, off your head, or head, off your face. But anyways, anyways, he, he, he'd do a number on you. And I, I, I was a young Christian. I look up there and I thought, oh Lord, I can't do this. I you know, a few times I'd back out of you. Say, you little wimp. I know I was a wimp. I don't care anymore. I don't care if it's who it is up there. But, you know, as a young Christian, I have to admit, I did that. See, I observed the wind. I observed the person, how they look. I observed the weather, the weather conditions. I observed the circumstances. I know you've got to use wisdom. I'm not saying I mean, you have to use wisdom and, and, and that type of thing. But uh, behold the sower. Verse 4, uh, he that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. Uh, as thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Verse 6, In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether they uh, whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. Now, uh, a lot of the commentaries have made application about the morning and evening there in verse 6. I think it has a twofold application. I believe it could be referring literally in the morning. All right, but that's, that's the only time you can sow. You can sow in the evening too. But in the morning sow thy seed, in the evening withhold not thine hand. 
In the morning could also be when you're young. And in the evening, that could be when you're older. So it could apply two different things. It could apply literally to the morning and the evening hours. And then it could apply, morning could apply to young, you being young in the morning, so that I see. I'll tell you what, when you get older, some of you folks can probably say amen. So when you get a little older, it's not as easy to so get the word of God out as it was when you were younger. It's just it's just the way it is. I'm not saying that older people can't do it because we got all like kind of ways of communicating now, uh, technology and so forth. But I'm just saying when you get older, it's not it's not as easy as it was when you was in your 20s and 30s and even 40s. And uh, you can't get around as well, and you can't uh, you just you know. So behold the sower. And so the main thing here, don't when you observe the wind, you observe the, the weather, the circumstances, and whatever it might be, don't let or the way people look or the way they're acting, you think they're gonna get they're gonna cuss me out. They're gonna get mad at me. If I say anything to them about the Lord, if I give them a gospel track and invite them out the church, you're observing the wind, you're observing the clouds, you're observing the snow and the sleet and the rain and whatever it might be. And so uh, again, you have to use wisdom. But uh, don't let circumstances determine when you sow the word of God. When somebody's lost and God dealt with your heart, uh, you need to uh, do what God would have you to do. And then in Isaiah 40, verse 9, I'll read the verse. Isaiah 40, verse 9, it says, O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Here it is. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. That's in Isaiah 40, verse 9. In Isaiah 40, verse 9, the end of that verse, Behold your God. I want to say that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Behold the man. Behold my servant. Behold the greater, he's greater than Jonah and Solomon. Behold the sower. And number six, behold your God. I'm glad Jesus was God. Amen. I quoted it earlier, 1 Timothy 3.16, uh, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Uh, a verse in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is God, was God, is God. And now the New World Translation, which is the Jehovah's Witness Bible, it says in John 1.1, 1, 1, along with other new versions, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. They make Jesus Christ distinct from God. They don't believe Jesus was God, but I want to say Jesus was God. Amen. 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 And He is God. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Another verse for the deity of Christ. Acts 20.28. 20, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he, God, the antecedent of he is God, to feed the church of God, which he, God, hath purchased with his own blood. So that means Jesus was God. Amen? Jesus was God. And so behold your God. And then last of all, number seven, look at John 19, 14. You might want to shout and run the aisles on this one. John chapter 19, Look at John 19 and verse uh, 14. What, uh, what Pilate uh, says here, John 19, 13. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha, John 19, 14. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and here it is. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. Amen. King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Behold your king. We see him in his might, his majesty, and his authority. The Bible says this, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt in John 12, 15. You realize one time back in, in John 6, 15, it says, John 6, 15, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king. It wasn't time for him to be king. The devil can try to, try to hurry up the process and try to make you something before God wants you to be that something. 
John 6, 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. The devil, the devil will try to make you a king before God wants you to be king. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. And so number seven, behold your king. I want to say when he comes back, uh, I, I got thinking about this in Revelation 19. When he comes back to this earth and wipes out the, uh, the nations at the battle of Armageddon and the blood is a horse's bridle high, which is about, what, four or five feet high there and over there in Jerusalem in that area over there. Blood splattered everywhere. God's going to wipe out the nation because all nations eventually, including America, right. all nations eventually turn on Israel. And when the Lord God Almighty comes back in Revelation 19 at the Battle of Armageddon, he wipes out all of the nations there. And we come back with him, by the way, in Revelation 19. I'm going to be riding a horse, praise God. Amen. <laughs> and uh, if you're saved, you'll be riding a horse. Coming back to this earth, and he's going to set up a thousand-year millennial reign. Well, you know what it says? Let me read it, and I'll close. Revelation 19, uh, 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in white linen, uh, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And Revelation 19, 16, and he hath put on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Amen. What a king. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And so as I close here today, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the man. Behold my servant. Behold the greater. He said, I'm greater than Jonah. I'm greater than Solomon. You think, think if I stood up here and told you, I want all of you to know this. I'm the best. I'm the greatest. I'm greater than all of you. I'm greater than all your forefathers. All your dads and grandpas and Jonah and Solomon and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and everybody, I'm the greatest. You'd say, that's stupid, proud, egotistical, arrogant preacher. Jesus could do that. Right. Jesus, behold, a greater than Jonas is here, he said. Matthew 12, we read it. Greater than Solomon is here. Number five, behold the sower. He went around sowing the word of God. Number six, behold your God. And then number seven, behold your king. Let's all stand if you would.